What's up, sports fans? My name is Lucas Weiss, host of the Weiss Sports Chronicles podcast. We got a great episode for you today with Luke Fox. He is a hockey writer for Sportsnet.ca, covering the Toronto Maple Leafs. In this episode, I chat with Luke about covering the Toronto Maple Leafs, working a locker room, as well as his approach to reporting on the hockey, the NHL, and his sports media career, and how him writing about music and hip-hop allowed him to be a better sports writer, which he is now at, at Sportsnet.ca. So, it's a really fascinating conversation with one of Sportsnet.ca's leading hockey writers. The Wii Sports Chronicles podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So make sure to like, rate, watch, and subscribe to all three of those channels. Now let's get to today's episode with Luke Fox on the Wii Sports Chronicles podcast. All right, as I said off the top, I am pleased to be joined by Luke Fox. He is an NHL writer for Sportsnet. You can see a lot of his work on there. He, he often covers the Toronto Maple Leafs. He's also a freelance music writer, so we'll dig into some of that as well. Luke, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today on the Wii Sports Chronicles podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Lucas. This is great. Well, Luke, we'll, we'll get into your career in just a bit, but obviously as we're recording this, the NHL hasn't determined when the 2021 season will begin. There's talk about January 1st. I'm just sort of curious what you've thought of the offseason thus far, in particular for the Toronto Maple Leafs, who have made a lot of moves since the last time we saw them in Game 5 against the Columbus Blue Jackets. Yeah, I, I like the fact that, that Kyle Dubas hasn't been stubborn, that mm-hmm. he's been willing to, to change his approach a little bit. Uh, you know, I think he's done some fine work. I think one of the best moves he did was getting out of the gates early and getting a first-round pick for Kasper Kapanen, who, you know, they obviously decided internally wasn't the best use of, of cap space and that if they could get multiple guys maybe by committee they could fill in those goals and alter uh, the leadership mix in the dressing room. Uh, and you look at teams like the, the Golden Knights who had to give away Nate Schmidt for basically mm-hmm. nothing or the Tampa Bay Lightning who are in a crunch right now and, and are having a hard time giving away guys off their roster. I think by getting out of the pack early and, and getting a first rounder for Capitan kind of allowed Kyle the leeway to, to do what he did in terms of ravaging the bargain bin basically on the UFA market and filling in, filling in the gaps. And he also changed the mix of the blue line and created more competition in the blue line to the point where a guy like Travis Dermott, who was getting tons of minutes towards the end of the season is now going to be fighting for a job. And, and I think that's a good thing. I think he built, he's built up internal competition. And I also think, uh, that it's it, it kind of allows the team not to let their foot off the gas, which which I think happened at various points in the regular season, and there's going to be some pressure to perform right away. A uh, little bit more sandpaper, as mm-hmm. they say, with 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 a guy like Simmons, a guy like Zach Bogosian. I think TJ Brody's an upgrade from from CC uh, mm-hmm. on the right side. So I, I think he's done some fine work. Absolutely, and you certainly mentioned the blue line, which is certainly upgraded, and it will be interesting to see how how that shakes out. But I think you mentioned with the Leafs the sandpaper concept, and I think you know depending on who you talk to in in Toronto sports media or in hockey media, the whole definition of grit seems to be different, and this whole concept of the Toronto Maple Leafs needed to add more grit and, and veteran experience. How important will guys like like a Wayne Simmons, like you mentioned, like a Joe Thornton, be in that locker room, particularly mixing in with some of the younger stars on the Leafs, like an Austin Matthews or a Mitch Marner? Well, they're important. I mean, the, he targeted those guys and went out and got them. He, like, he tried hard to get Thornton. There were other options for Thornton. He spoke to Wayne Simmons, got permission from Buffalo before free agency even opened. So, you know, it, it tells you that he wasn't completely satisfied uh, with the leadership mix in that room. And they're, these guys are young. I mean, I think people get on them because it's four straight exits from the postseason without winning around. But 
that they're still like either just entering their prime or not even at it. Um, so I think they wanted uh, some older voices, you know, that guys like Patrick Marlowe and Ron Hainsey were lost and they weren't really replaced. Um, so what's going to be interesting for me is that dynamic because you got the young core wearing the letters, Marner, Matthews, and Riley, but then you got this this other group that doesn't wear letters officially, but are their words are going to carry a lot of weight in in Simmons, in Joe Thornton, Jake Muzzin already was that guy kind of wearing an invisible letter. Uh, you know, on paper, I think it should be a good mix, but we'll see. It, it, it'll be a bit of an interesting dynamic because, you know, you want the young guys to listen to those guys, but is Joe Thornton going to be able to play? you know, 12, 15 minutes a night, or is, does his voice carry less weight if he can't keep up? I mean, he's the oldest forward in the NHL. So it's going to be fascinating. And, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely not going to be the same group. I mean, there's, there's some really strong personalities coming in, uh, but they're going to be fun to watch as always. Luke, of course, as I said off the top, we we don't really know when the, the, the next NHL season is going to begin. There's talk about an all-Canadian division, which I think will be very fascinating if that comes to fruition. But how is your job going to change? I mean, I know you got a bit of a taste with, with the restart about how your job is so much different than it was to even start 2020. But in, in the new season, like, do you expect more just Zoom calls? Do you expect to be traveling if, if it, is, it ends up being an all-Canadian division? What are just your thoughts on on reporting on the NHL as it begins to restart on a new season? Yeah, it was it was a bit of an adjustment for sure. Uh, reporting and the the bubble, I got to go to some games in those empty arenas, which <laughs> was fantastic. But not even coming within a stone's throw of a, a player or a coach, so you miss that that personal interaction. You get a better feel for the team, the team dynamic, where their mindsets at. You can ask follow-up questions and get one-on-ones, you know, quietly in the dressing room. All that's gone, you know, through the Zoom calls, you're only allowed usually one or two questions and then they move on. Getting gears a bit, Luke, I want to talk a bit about your career in sports, in sports media and media in general, because I've had several guests on this podcast and to me, the connective theme is that there's no silver bullet. There's no linear path to get to where you want to get to in sports media. For you, you actually started out in music. So I'm just curious what that was like for you, just wanting to get into that area of journalism. Yeah, my path was was anything but, but linear. Mm-hmm. When I went to the school for journalism in in North Bay, I had two co-op placements that I absolutely loved. One was uh, covering junior hockey, uh, the North Bay Centennials at the time. Chris Neal was was their big star, so that that (laughs) dates me a little bit. And the other one was kind of a a dream internship where I went down to Dallas where I had an uncle and and cousin who lived there. I stayed with them and, and I Shout out to Mike Heike, who covered the Dallas Stars mm-hmm. for the Dallas Morning News. And this was 1999, the year they'd go on to win the Stanley Cup. Uh, so I, I followed Heike around and got to go to the games. I remember one of my big thrills was up in the press box, they let me pick the three stars one night, <laughs> which, which was uh, a, a great thrill for, for a young aspiring journalist. Um, and I wrote a few stories I think one got published, but most, you know, he would just look over and give me tips on. Um, and I got to do interviews. Ken Hitchcock was the coach at the time, got to go and meet into meetings with him. And it was just, you know, absolutely fabulous. But I failed to, to channel that into a, into a career in, in sports journalism. So sports kind of fell uh, on the back burner. And uh, my other passion is music, specifically rap music and uh, I, I got involved with some friends of mine or they became friends of mine who launched a, a hip hop magazine called Pound in Toronto and uh, this was when the, the music industry was act- actually had money um, so I, I got to do uh, hundreds of interviews with, with rap artists and sometimes I'd, 
I'd go on planes and go to New York or LA to conduct these interviews. And I didn't get paid a whole ton. And sometimes I didn't get paid at all, but uh, it really strengthened my, my writing and, and interviewing chops, I think. But it also was a thrill on a, on a personal level to, to get to ask these guys questions and, and spend a, a little bit of time with them. So uh, I spun that off in, into writing for other publications. Music wise, I held down a, a day job at a, a snowboard magazine doing copy editing. Uh, this place called SBC Media, based out of Toronto, that was a, a, a mini empire in the action sports world. They did skateboarding, snowboarding, skiing, windsurfing, kiteboarding, surfing. All these, all these publications, like hard print publications. So I did editing and writing for them as a day job, and, and pursued music writing on the side. Um, Anyway, long story short, I, I eventually uh, applied for a, a job when Sportsnet was launching its print publication. Didn't get that, but they said, you know what, we might be hiring uh, for our website. So I got the job as hockey editor, and over time, uh, I convinced them to, for me to do less editing and more writing, because that's, that's where my passion lies. Um, and pushed to the point where I got to started doing regular Leafs coverage, and I've been to a few Stanley Cup finals now, some All Star games, and I absolutely love the uh, the big events, especially and and being on the road and being in the action and reporting on on stuff that's that's happening live is is probably the the greatest thrill for me right now. Lot to unpack there, but really, yeah. thank you so much for the for, for the candid answer because there's, there's there's so much so many good things. But I want to go back to what you talked about those co-op placements because you mentioned it in your bio on Sportsnet.ca about how this you know co-op placement was so important for you. And I always say to some of my younger journalistic colleagues, as well as people wanting to get into the business is this whole notion of reps and getting reps as early as you can. So for you, when you look back at, you know, now you're, you're covering all these big events, how big were getting the chance to know what a press box is like at such a young age in just shaping your whole understanding and overall passion for the industry? Yeah, it's, it's huge, right? Um, you just got to throw yourself in there. Like, I remember my first few, few scrums. I didn't even know really what the, the etiquette was. Where do I stand? How high should I place my <laughs> mini recorder? Uh, you know, you don't want to be one of those scrum lurkers. And, like, when do I get to pipe up and ask a question? How many questions do I get to ask? When is When should I just zip it and be quiet? Um, so... You know, people can give you tips, and I've certainly sought out advice from from coworkers. But a lot of it is just throwing yourself into the fire and learning from your own mistakes and your your own successes. Uh, but the more you do it, the less you know starstruck you get. If it, you know some athlete of of some fame, uh, the more you realize they're just people. The more you realize how to phrase your questions, what what tends to work, what, what doesn't, um, you know, going in with a plan helps, but so does the, uh, the freedom to abandon that plan. If you stumble upon something more interesting or, or juicier, uh, and saying, even though I had this follow-up question prepared, I'm going to throw that out the window because Mitch Marner just said something really interesting about, about this topic. And I want to follow that up. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the more you do it, the more you, you feel free to, to be, flexible and on the fly i would say and then you mentioned how you you know were were, were involved with this with this music magazine and, and and whatnot producing content back when magazines were were one of the popular yeah. methods to, to to produce uh stellar content i'm just curious luke for you what skills or just knowledge did you learn about that startup environment? Because it, it, it must have just been an opportunity to just be just hustling, right? Just constantly on the grind to make sure that not only are you producing content, but people are reading your content. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, we could spend all day talking about the different things I learned from that. Uh, you know, I worked 
I, work, I never had an ownership stake in it, mm. uh, but I worked pretty closely. So I, I saw, I saw the thing through uh, from the, you know, I sometimes I'd go on sales meetings with with the sales guy and and see how they pitch advertisers. I'd you know be in meetings where they're dealing with the printer and knowing about how you get the the thing from uh, a spreadsheet to getting printed. And I learned about color correction and uh, you know line editing and and titles and photo selection and like, like on and on and on. I, I learned pretty much everything about uh, the business, which is pretty much a, in a dire way, unfortunately, I kind of wrap my head around the bigger picture and realized, you know, yes, I'm, I'm writing a story. I'm, it gave me a, a great perspective on, on the business as a whole, publishing as a whole, um, and you know the the kind of dance that you do between journalism and, and selling a product. Mm. Um, so I I kind of learned a bit more about the business, which was wasn't something I was trying to learn about. It's not where my my passion lies, but I think it has been valuable in kind of opening my eyes to to how things work, how websites work, how magazines work. How different is music journalism to sports journalism? I mean, I know they're different beats, but there must be some similarities, especially if you're doing features on artists and features on athletes, but they also are very different just because of, you know, the different methods of what these, what, what the subjects do. Yeah. I find the subjects are the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I, How so? I interviewed a lot of hip hop. Uh, I interviewed a lot of hip hop artists and they want to say, you know, you know, the, those big headline grabbing things. They mm. want to make bold statements. They're artists. They're creative people. They want to stand out from the pack. Uh, there's And they, they love to, you know, talk about themselves as well. And covering mainly hockey players, they're part of a team. They have to be careful what they say. They don't want to ruffle feathers. Mm. Uh, they, they kind of want to slide into the pack. They, they don't want to say something that you know, causes a stir, whereas it's almost the exact opposite in music. Uh, certainly my, my most uh, entertaining interviews have, have been with musicians more than, more than athletes. I'm, I mean, I'm talking generally, there have been some, some really fun athlete interviews, but I think they're just a bit more cautious of, of sticking out um, a little bit more media savvy in, in kind of not a fun way from, from a, a reporter's point of view, because they, they just want to, they want to play it safe. They might rely on, on cliches. And part of that, I think is just the nature of the job. Hockey players have to talk multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. A music artist, you know, when they were available, it was usually because they had something to promote, something to sell a new album, a new single, a new video, whatever. Uh, so they don't, talk to reporters day in and day out i think there's a fatigue that comes with that um for athletes and it, and it sometimes it shows in their answers did you find also luke that building trust with the artists was a lot easier than than the athletes just because the artists are more willing to as you say share your share their thoughts share their share their process compared to athletes who, who are sort of more media savvy as you as you alluded to yeah, I think you could build you could build trust with an athlete, but I think it takes it it's it's a longer game. Mm. It's showing up for every practice, every game. They see your face. They they know you haven't burned them or, or tried to get them to say something controversial just for the sake of it. You can build up trust. I think a, a professional relationship with with athletes. I, I have over the years with with some some you know. Uh, put up a guard and, mm -hmm. and probably will always have that guard up. Maybe they got burned in the past or, or maybe they just, they don't want to play the, the media game. Um, where uh, for the musicians, I would say I would try to ask deep questions that, that showed that I've really listened to their, their work in the past. And usually I, I was a fan, not all the time, but usually I was a, a fan of their music. And I think that would come through, through my questions 
not because I'm, I'm fanning out and, and <laughs> saying how great they are, but if you ask a really detailed question that build up, okay, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about my process or talk about this song with, with this guy because I, I think he's, he's a real listener. So hip hop music, you're you're a big fan of rap music. So are you are you like a Tupac guy, Biggie Smalls? Are you more into like the Drake, J Cole, Kendrick? Like what's your what's your level of uh, hip hop taste these days? Well, I'd say all of the above. Okay. Uh, yeah, you you mentioned some some greats. Um, I'm definitely more of the the Tupac and Biggie era, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm constantly looking for, for new music I, I stay up on uh new stuff uh lately like the past few months i've just been listening to a ton of griselda stuff nice like benny the butcher so luke for you you you're so you do the music focus it much on that you then as you said joined sportsnet in 2011 sportsnet in 2011 very different than it is in sportsnet in 2020 and I'm just curious for you, I know that you're more into the writing, but I guess now you're also doing a lot of the multi-platform stuff, like appearing on the radio, like appearing on podcasts. So I guess, have you grown as a journalist since your time starting at Sportsnet in 2011, just in terms of the skills that you have to rely on in your work? Yeah, I'd like to think so. I remember the very first time I got asked to go on the radio, I was uh, I was a nervous wreck. Like, uh, um, I was really panicking. I was like, oh, no, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Just because it wasn't something I was really pursuing. I never had a dream to be in front of the camera or, or have my voice on radio. I always kind of just preferred making connections with people and, and trying to write their stories in, in hopefully a, a fun or insightful way. And uh, but the nature of the beast is you have to be multi-platform. So I think it's been good for, for my development to push myself. And now I don't really think twice about it. I'm much more comfortable. I probably do two or three podcasts or radio appearances a week now. Um, so I, I think they've, they've gotten easier or maybe I'm just getting you getting more used to it. Uh, it's been good for me. And then often, uh, I've done a few TV hits here and there as well. And it, it's kind of, you have to be versatile uh, to survive in this industry. I think, uh, you know, your employer wants people who are willing to, to appear on multi-platform. And I think it's been good. It's, it's kind of pushed me to do that because kind of my, the safe, easy thing for me to do is to sit in front of a laptop and, and pound out a thousand words. But um, you know, it's forced me to, to try and improve, how to voice my my opinion or, or share some some stories uh you know on, on radio or on podcasts like this so i I, th I think it's been beneficial how would you say your experience in music journalism helped you become a better sports journalist i don't know um that's a good question i i, I don't know if if it if it did, I, I think maybe uh, uh, coming into it, I'd hear questions people ask sometimes, and they, and they felt like they weren't great questions. Sometimes players get knocked for their answer, but if you step back and, and you heard the question, maybe the question wasn't good enough. Mm. And I think just that the the volume of interviews I did, and they were all one-on-one -on -one interviews, so you have to come up with all the questions. You're not in a scrum where you're plucking quotes from other people's questions, which is, is something that just has to happen in, in sports because, you know, the game's over and then all the reporters rush into the room and we're all descending on the guy who got the hat trick. So that, that's just going to happen. So I think just by having done, conducted so many interviews where I asked all the questions, I got a good sense of what questions lead to usable, good, quotable answers. Uh, so that when I'm in the scrum, I really try and think, hey, I'm only going to get one or two questions. Let's make them count. Maybe I can get a question that, that yields a good answer that will, will help um, the finished product, the story. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you swing and you miss. Sometimes you get, you get shot down it, or sometimes you, you get a cliche. But I think all the interviews I did during my 
my music writing time probably helped me ask better questions when it when it came time to to go in the dressing room. I think that's a really good point because I think for a lot of young journalists, they're they're just beginning that process of learning to ask questions. I think anyone can remember that first time they ask a question in, in a scrum, and it's like, wow, like that's amazing. But it's it's all about the reps and it's all about the growth. And then I think throughout experiences, through more reps, you then begin to develop a process where sort of like you, you then know, okay, what what are the sorts of questions that are going to yield better responses? And look, sometimes athletes may not want to say much and, and that's that's okay, but at least you know are, and are aware of your process to know what type of questions will, will hopefully produce the best answers. And look, it takes time. And I and I feel like a lot of journalists still are, are learning to evolve in that in that light, but it certainly is important to, to know, especially if you want to succeed in this industry. Yeah, I, I'll I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Mike Babcock, who uh, no longer coaches the Leafs, of course, but he was he was a tricky guy to interview because mm-hmm. if you asked him, and I did, I learned the hard way. <laughs> if you asked him a yes or no question, sometimes he would just say yes or no. Mm. And you couldn't use that. It was unusable. Even if it was a, a fair topic you raised, he answered the question, but the way you phrased it allowed him to get away with just a yes or a no. So, you know, it was kind of a, a hard lesson to learn at points because um, he kind of made you look a little bit foolish, maybe, for how you phrased your question, but he improved you. Like he sharp, kind of sharpened your sword. He made you come with a uh, better phrasing of of that question the next time um so you know i appreciate that and then other go- other coaches or, or players are, are just easy going and you you just mention a topic you mention the power play and it doesn't matter how you phrase it they're going to run with it they're, they're there to help um but you know difficult interviews sometimes hurt at, at the time or, or are challenging at the time but they make you a, a better interviewer in the future I've had journalists, Luke, on this podcast who have covered big market teams as well as small market teams. And one of the things they say about covering big market teams is, look, the fan base, it's passionate. It, it, it's, you know, they want to read your content. But one of the drawbacks is that there's so many journalists covering the team that it may be harder to stand out. Do you sort of get that with, with, with covering the Toronto Maple Leafs, a big market in hockey and how do you sort of stand out given all the the reporting and attention that's placed on this hockey team? Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, especially now in the, the Zoom era where everyone's <laughs> getting the same quotes. It, 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 it does provide a, a challenge. I kind of like that challenge, to be mm. honest, you know, to try and, and stick out and, and not necessarily be better, but be be different or or come at it with a different take or um, maybe, you know, find a different source. Uh, It's, it's a good challenge. And I think it keeps everyone on their toes, Uh, but it is difficult. I mean, especially after a game when usually in Toronto, they'll trot out one guy at a time and there's a huge scrum around each guy and everyone's getting this, hearing the same questions and answers. I've been in, you know, some of the away rooms, and it's not like that. There, there might be 12 guys sitting at their stall after a game, all sweaty and exhausted, and you, and you can just walk up and talk to whoever, and you can get something more unique that way. Uh, the thing with the, the Leafs is people read your stuff. You know, we, we put up anything Toronto Maple Leafs related on sports, that, and people will click. Uh, and I'm constantly aware of that. I, I, so I try not to – I try not to do – weak stuff uh you know sometimes you just make do with what you have but i am very cognizant of the fact that a lot of people will be reading it and people that really care about the team so you try to come at it from an honest place and hopefully a creative place so in in building off of that how do you conquer that challenge and i guess do you and how long did it sort of take you in, in terms of covering the Leafs in terms of years or number of games, whatever metric you want to use, before you really felt comfortable in, in being in covering this team and feeling like okay, like my stuff is different from what you're reading in other outlets? 
Uh, I don't know. Um, I think I, I think I started feeling more comfortable once, um, I started the, the stars of the team were guys that I started covering when they were prospects. Mm. So like, uh, I, I really start feeling comfortable when I was talking to Mitch Marner, when he was a prospect who might come to the Leafs, uh, or Austin Matthews, who may may go to leaps if they win the lottery um that that gave me a little bit more comfort because i felt the the older veterans had been there they they had stronger relationships with journalists who had been covering the team longer than me or before me uh like phil kessel i i you know started covering the team when he was just about to leave so yes i'd be in his scrums and everything but we didn't really have a, a rapport from day one that, that he might have with, with someone else. Um, so I think the core that is there now, I've seen most of them for years and years. Um, so that, that helps. I think they, they know I'm a familiar face. Um, but it's, it's kind of, you know, covering a, a, a team, especially in a pseudo beat reporter role that I'm in. I also do some league wide stuff, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I do go to pretty much every home game, most practices. Uh, so in that beat reporter role, it's kind of a long game. It's kind of just showing your face, asking lots of questions, being kind of present there around the team a long time. And eventually they feel more comfortable with you. You feel more comfortable with them. Uh, and then you can take take things in different directions and that they're more receptive to it. Speaking of that, and I know that the Zoom era makes it a bit more challenging, but you mentioned earlier how you love covering the big events and you've had the chance to cover some Stanley Cup finals and and all-star games. What is it about those big events, Luke? Because I think you can have sort of two thoughts. I mean, one, like this, these are the biggest events in hockey. It's a huge opportunity. A lot more people are reading your stuff, but then you can also maybe yearn for that sort of, t- you know, Tuesday night in the winter time where there's not as much media, so it's more relaxed. Well, I would say like the cup finals, the alternate, and mm. I've gotten to go out. One is when it's actually won and the reporters actually get to go out on the ice. Uh, hope that you don't slip <laughs> and run around yeah, snapping photos, talking to players, talking to family members. I think what makes that that great is the stakes mm. the stakes are so high as opposed to a tuesday in in carolina in november right like th- this is guys lifelong dream is is on the line if they win this thing so the tension is high and then if they do it the excitement is is off the charts um so, so some of the the greatest moments are are there when you're out on the ice talking to them seeing them hug their family members it's like you know, it's, it's dream come true type stuff. So, uh, you know, it's not, Hey, we got another two points and we're in the playoff race. It's, it's finally there. Uh, I remember talking to Ryan O'Reilly's dad, um, after the blues won the cup, that was the last final I covered. I didn't go to Edmonton, uh, for the lightning win. Um, and, and it was just like, I don't know the emotions attached to, to that make it really fun to to be a part of in a very small way and and you want to really honor that with with your story you know hopefully you document it the right way to to kind of capture what that means to to the players and their families i know as a journalist covering the cup final like look i mean there you mean you don't care who wins who loses but given those high stakes is there a sense of pressure for you to like perform and, and make sure that, okay, like this is going to be my best work because of the moment that is the Stanley cup final. Yeah. I think, I think there is a little bit more electricity in the building for the big people in the press box too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do think, think so. I think people try to bring their a game um, to, to their coverage with, when it's, a, when it's a championship. Yeah. I, I think that's very accurate. And, and it's fun too. I find it, I find it's easier to do the job when the story is like that, when, when, when there's something big at stake, as opposed to trying to spin something out of, you know, game 43 on the schedule. Um, you know, it, it's a little, it's a, it, it, there's pressure to make it good, but it's almost easier to make it good because 
you have some excitement around the event as well. I want to end with just talking a little bit about the future. And obviously, you know, it's so uncertain right now what's going to happen with the NHL and just how sports media is going to look in, in 2021. But when you look at your whole career, Luke, it, it, to me what defines it is just, you know, willing willing to grind, willing to hustle. And I think a lot of young journalists who are, you know, always ask, I mean, what's, you know, what's that one big, big piece of advice? I think, you know, having that hustle, having that grind is so, so important. For, for you, I mean, as, as we go into next year and beyond, I mean, how, how important were those years of just willing to do whatever it takes in terms of dealing with this uncertain time where you may have to adjust, you may have to figure out new ways to produce content? Because I feel like, it's a time for every journalist that everyone's sort of in the same boat, but I feel like those that have been on that, you know, journey of different opportunities and learning things along the way are better suited to, to handle these uncertain times. Yeah. I, well, I've been grinding since I was 11 years old <laughs> and started my own lawn cutting and babysitting business. Like I just, I've always worked. Um, so I do think that served me well. I feel like when the going gets tough, I'll find a way to, to, to find work or make work for myself. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. So when I started at Sportsnet, I had a, a day job where basically nine to five ish. I was on the computer, writing headlines, editing other people's stories, posting them to the website. If there was some downtime, maybe I'd write a story of my own, but it wasn't regular. Um, so I do my whole shift and then I found out we could get, um, press passes to Leafs game. So after my whole shift, then I would go to a Leaf game, watch it, uh, go to the, go to the scrum, do interviews. And I wasn't getting paid extra or, or granted overtime for that. That was me be, being, I don't want to be at this desk. I want to be in the field. So I'm going to have to put in another five hours of, work i mean i'm at a i'm at a hockey game it's it's fun but it, it it is time away from my family it is time i'm not you know uh downloading rap music or whatever else i want to do so uh you do have to have a little bit of of grinded out mentality or um perseverance if if, if that's something you want to do uh you know you, i got a foot in the door i was lucky enough to get a foot in the door but i I've had to push it and I'm constantly doing that. Um, you know, I, my Boston, my bosses have never said to me, Hey, Luke, do you want to go to the Stanley cup final? I've gone to my bosses and said, can I please, please come to the Stanley <laughs> cup final? I'll do this, this, and this, I'll do two things a day, whatever. Um, so you have, you know, for young journalists, I think you, if this is really what you want to do, you can't do it, be in it just for the money. Cause there mm -hmm. isn't much. You have to do it because it's it's what you love, and and you might have to put in a little extra work or extra effort to make it happen. Last question for you, Luke, and I and I gotta ask: You ran home from your first sleepover because they didn't show Hockey Night in Canada. Was that the moment where you said to yourself, "I'm gonna be in sports journalism"? Tell me that story because I think the listeners would really appreciate that. Sorry. You cut out. Oh, sorry. So can you just the sleepover? Yeah, just the sleepover story. Can you hear me, Luke? Sorry, just the sleepover question. Sorry. You just want me to tell this story? Yeah, just you know about about that story. Okay, yeah. It's it's great. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, I think I was in grade two, and one of my best friends lived down the street like uh i grew up just outside of collingwood ontario kind of on a, a rural dirt road and he he was you know uh about two blocks away and it was like okay you know we're gonna have snacks we're gonna i'm gonna have my flute first sleepover this will be fun we're gonna play games you know get out the coleco vision or whatever uh and then it came to eight o'clock at night it was a saturday night and I realized their family didn't watch hockey. They didn't watch hockey, uh, hockey night in Canada on Saturday nights. And on our street, there was only two, two channels. Uh, the cable hadn't arrived yet because I lived outside of town and I couldn't believe it. And it gave me a sense of, of panic. And I was like, I, 
I can't go through with this. I can't stay at this, this dude's house. I got to go home. So I ran home and, and, you know, my dad had hockey night on. And so I set, settled in and everything was right in the world again. Do you remember, do you remember the game that was on? No. I don't know. Sorry. I, I can't remember that. I'd be lying. I'd be making something up. I'm sure, I'm sure it was Leafs, but I did. I didn't grow up a Leafs fan. My dad was a Leafs fan, but I was actually uh, an Oilers fan because I had a, a Gretzky obsession. Nice, nice. Well, listen, Luke Fox, he is an NHL writer for Sportsnet. Make sure to ch- check out his content on there. Luke, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your story today on the We Sports Chronicles podcast. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks, Lucas.